Welcome, 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 everybody. My name is Philip Duff, and this is a bit of a New York edition. I'm coming to you live from Manhattan, together with Nicola Nicolatic, the mastermind behind the award-winning cocktail menus of Patent Pending here in New York City, and his friend, my friend, everybody's friend, well-known bartender about town, last seen in the much-missed existing conditions, and now making alcoholic jelly like you've never had at Solid Wiggle, Mr. Jack Schramm. Nicola, how's things there? Amazing, man. Guys, uh, pleasure uh, sharing the screen with you. Welcome to Button Pending. Hopefully we're going to have some fun and drink some soju. I've had the privilege of seeing your recipe ahead of time, so I'm really interested in sharing it with everybody. And uh, Jack, I, I kind of like your home bar, man. Thank you very much. It's uh, it served me well without without a real uh, you know functioning bar to work from. I've got almost everything I need back here to come up with cocktails. So it's it's almost like having a real bar to work from. Yeah, if that's an almost, then I'm terrified as to what your everything would look like. <laughs> we'll get there one day. I promise. It's a it's it's the ice well and the actual uh, you know speed rail is the only thing that's missing. But yeah, plus, that, you know, yeah. the two hour breakdowns after you're done. Oh, that's the best part. You know, you crack that shift drink and, you know, you, you that that slow breakdown with with all your friends. Of course. Oh, lovely, lovely. So here's what's going to happen. I am going to do a little quick show you 101 for anyone who might not be up to date. It's going to take about five minutes. But at the end. I'm going to have a tasting of some of the ingredients that Nicola and Jack are using, specifically one shochu that Nicola has and an awamori that Jack is going to use. So we're going to discuss it and discuss how they approached the shochu and then how they applied it to the cocktail that they have. And then we're all going to hang out and chat a bit and answer your questions. So all that said, let's go for shochu 101. If you're already a shochu ninja, uh, go grab yourself a coffee or a shochu and come back in about five minutes. Otherwise, stick around for the history of one of the world's most remarkable spirits. There we go. Shochu 101. This is also available online, of course, at the same link, shochu.guide. So the first time we have anybody referring to a distilled spirit in Japan at all is when a Portuguese explorer wrote in 1546 about drinking strong Araki. Now, this wasn't Arak from Indonesia, and it wasn't Rakia from Eastern Europe, and it wasn't Raki from the Middle East. That was just the word he used to describe something strong and distilled. And we don't really know what it was that he had, but it was strong. However, only 13 years later, we have the first definitive mention of shochu in Japan. And I love this whole story. A couple of workmen were hired to help fix a shrine. And they left behind hidden graffiti saying the priest was so stingy, he wouldn't even give us any shochu, which is a great way to kick off the history of this magnificent spirit in Japan Two workmen complaining they didn't get enough when they were at work. Now, the heartland of shochu is Kyushu region, centered around Okinawa. The area is also called the Ruku Kingdom. You can make shochu everywhere in Japan and shochu outsells sake in Japan, which is a bit of a mind boggling statistic if you think about it. But what is it? Well, there's almost 50 ingredients that you can use to make shochu. You can make it from seaweed and sugar. You can make it from kelp and ginger and sesame. But 70% of all the shochu that's drunk in Japan is made from barley, sweet potato, or rice. Obviously, uh, barley and rice are the oldest uh, ingredients. Sweet potato came a few hundred years later to Japan when one of the shoguns imported it from South America via trade links with the Portuguese because the sweet potato was a great and efficient way of growing enough calories to feed his people. The major thing about shochu is it's a distilled spirit, which means that yeast is involved to turn sugar into alcohol, but a mold called koji 
aspergillus, usually the aspergillus oryzae uh, strain, use, is used to sacrify the main ingredient. What this means is the starches in the barley or sweet potato or rice or brown sugar or anything else are converted into sugar by this mold. And then the yeast converts the sugar into alcohol. But the koji doesn't just convert starch into sugar. It also adds almost unfathomable depths of flavor and not unimportant. It throws off high levels of citric acid. Citric acid is important because most shochu traditionally was made in the tropical regions of southwestern Japan, where during fermentation, often a batch would be spoiled by bacteria. So a high acid batch with lots of citric acid would fend off any infection and it would wind up tasting delicious as well. If you're familiar with how brandy and cognac are made, you're probably aware that the wine that's used to make brandy or cognac doesn't really taste very nice because it's very high in acid. So there's three types of shochu roughly analogous to whiskey, single malt, blend, and grain. So our single malt is called honkaku. It's single distilled in a pot still. It used to be called otsurai, but now since 1971, it's called honkaku. Has to be bottled at 45% ABV or less. Usually in Japan, it's bottled and sold at 25% ABV. Continually distilled uh, shochu, korowai, uses a column still, and it has to be bottled at less than 36%. And if you blend the pot still and column still, you get what's called konwa shochu. And if it's got more pot still than column still, it's called otsurai korowai, konwa. And if it has more column still than pot still, it's called korowai otsurai. Konwa. These are relatively rare here in the USA, so don't worry about the definitions too much. And for the purposes of today, we're going to be talking about nothing but delicious, delicious uh, honkaku shochu and a bit of awamori as well. So once you've fermented and distilled it, you can rest the shochu in ceramics or glass or stainless steel or you can age it in a wooden barrel. But if you've been watching the other webinars today, you may have heard uh, my friend Julia Mimose point out that you're only allowed to age shochu up to a certain darkness of color, believe it or not. You can age it as long as you like, but it can only get so dark and no darker. That's a law in Japan to stop people being confused between barley shochu and Japanese whiskey. Now, Awamori, which Jack is going to be mixing with in a moment, is in a way the sort of mezcal of shochu. It has the same relationship to shochu that tequila does to mezcal. It's the ancestor, and it's from Okinawa. What it is, is 100% long grain indica rice, Thai rice, only black koji, we'll talk about koji in a moment, and it's a single fermentation. The koji and the yeast and the rice are all fermented together. Otherwise, in making shochu, you usually uh, have what's called a double fermentation, which I'll explain in a moment. But not with awamori. In awamori, boom, it all goes in together. There's no added sugar and no carbohydrates in shochu either. So you can see this map here of all the main areas where they use different ingredients. But of course, you can make sweet potato shochu anywhere in Japan. You can make barley shochu anywhere in Japan. You can make rice shochu anywhere in Japan. And remember, like I said, rice, barley, and sweet potato constitute 70 to 75% of all the shochu that is drunk in Japan. And by the way, that is a lot of shochu. Now, Let's dive in a little bit more on koji. So in the beginning, there was only yellow koji. Now, this does give you a fruity and sophisticated taste, like the slide says, but it didn't throw off quite enough 
citric acid in the beginning before we had laboratories and scientists to fend off bacterial infection. Enter black koji. This came into the mainstream in Japan from Okinawa. And the black koji may even have come from abroad. It gives a rich depth and earthiness. It's very complex. Uh, it can be a little rough and muscular. Now, the newest type of koji is actually white koji, which, believe it or not, is a mutation from black koji. And white koji is, in fact, the most commonly used type of koji in shochu. It gives a kind of a, a light, sweet taste that, you know, most people like. And there it is. That is koji. That's the mold, Aspergillus oryzae. And like any mold, it has to grow on something, as you may have observed, looking at the leftovers from Christmas in your fridge. A mold can grow on pretty much any food source, but usually the Aspergillus mold is inoculated into rice. It doesn't have to be. For instance, the Ichiko brand of barley shochu, they like to inoculate their koji into barley grains. So they're, you know, a double barley shochu. That's cool. So you inoculate the koji into whatever it's going to feed off. And then you kind of let it sit and multiply in koji rooms like this one, in those boxes. When it gets up, to a certain uh, stage of growth, you mix the koji with yeast and water in the first fermentation, what's called the first maromi. You let the yeast and the koji propagate and get bigger and bigger and bigger, stirring them and agitating them a couple of times a day. And when they are all revved up and absolutely ravenous, boom, you start the second fermentation by adding the base ingredient of the shochu. It could be rice, sweet potato, barley, sesame, kelp, soba, buckwheat, anything you like. And the koji and the yeast <clears throat> fall on the base ingredients like wolves on the flock. The koji converts the starches into sugar and throws off high levels of citric acid as well as many other flavor components and the yeast converts all that sugar into alcohol and just like in any process once you've fermented it it's time to distill it's you distilling usually happens in stainless steel uh, stills since the 1950s it's become fairly common to use vacuum stills low pressure stills and some distilleries use a combination of regular stills and low pressure stills once the shochu has been distilled, it is then rested. It's always rested for at least 48 hours, but it may be rested for years and years. It can be rested in ceramic, like we said, like stainless steel since the 1920s. There's a nice uh, ceramic resting room. Or in glass. Awamori and some shochu distilleries actually have aging caves that they use or dig out themselves. You can buy a 1.8 liter bottle of shochu and the distillery will store it for you underground as long as you like. It's very common to buy such a bottle to mark an occasion like getting married or having a baby, as you might be able to tell from this picture. And however long it takes, whether it's 20 years, 10 years or 30 years, you can come back, pick out your bottle and drink it with your child, which would be a nice thing to do. So. The basic serves for shochu are like the basic serves for anything, anywhere. You can have a strainer on the rocks. You can have a mizuari with water. You can mix it with soda water or, and I highly recommend this, oyuari, warm water, verging on the hot. Four parts of water, six parts of shochu or awamori. A toddy, if you will but one of the most remarkable ones you'll ever taste. It doesn't need anything else, no citrus peel, no juice, no bitters, no lemon studded with cloves. Oyuari is perfect just the way it is. So time for a quick tasting with uh, Nicola. Are you ready, mate? Born ready, never prepared. So we've got a... Uh, 
a bit of a unicorn here, a 10-year-old shochu. They're quite rare. It's from Kumamoto, and it's rice. Low pressure and white koji, so we'd expect some delicate flavors. But 10 years, not in a regular oak barrel, but an evergreen oak. That's why it's only got this light straw color uh, to it. So do you want to tell us what you experienced and how that inspired your cocktail, Nicola? So... Shochu is not new to the road, but it's relatively new for us. So we have to have some reference points. Uh, first thing that crossed my mind when I tasted it, besides it's delicious by itself or mixing with water, was actually pisco sour. And it has some connection because pisco, same like a are like uh, one time distilled. And that allows uh, flavors to be more fresh and kind of like more connected to original ingredient that is used. So I tried to create a Japanese shochu inspired uh, cocktail that if you simplify, still tastes great because we don't have uh, many shochu classics. So I just did uh, shochu sour. Mugo and Konkaku shochu, uh, shochu is such an uh, astonishing bottle, uh, especially because uh, they have long history of uh, making very progressive uh, shoju. And what I love about the company is that it's still family owned and they always employ locals and locals as master distillers. So this is very beautiful, amber core, uh, 10 years aged in evergreen oak. And I think that rice flavor still lingers with mellow vanilla and subtle banana notes. So. Uh, first impression uh, when I try this product is to make sour that is going to be super delicious if you simplify the ingredients, but we are talking about subtle flavors and at bottom bending, this is how we do drinks. So I'm going to start with two ounces of angostura to round the drink, one fresh egg white. Right. Following by quarter of an ounce of kaki apple juice or Japanese apple, how we call it. And the health benefits uh, from kaki apple juice are the similar to the soju, which means it will stop your uh, blood from clogging and that's reducing stroke or heart disease. Following by half of an ounce of yuzu kosho cane. So yuzu kosho is widely available, uh, uses Japanese citrus and it's mixed with peppers. And then that yuzu kosho, it looks like this, we turn into a cane syrup that is really nice, potent, bright cane syrup, following by three quarter of lemon juice. And the main star, Mugon. 10 years old, two of an ounce. Now for the dry shake, I'm gonna add just a few pebble ice for extra delusion and better foam. So this will take a minute because it needs to talk to me and I'll just know when it's ready. What's really great about this drink, the cup of the apple juice, like the foam that is created is going to stay. Even if you leave the cocktail to sit for like 15 minutes, it's still going to be presentable. All right. I'm going to add some ice. And I'm going to try to awaken this drink. Things should be ready.
Nice good question. Such a beautiful criminals. And I honestly believe that uh, Mugen Rice Shoju is shining with this uh, sour style cocktail. So to finish it, I'm going to add some mint spring. Uh, mint doesn't tolerate uh, when people treat it heavily on your light swipe, you <clears throat> release beautiful refined oils, so no need to swipe it hard. And this is it. So just sour. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Nicola. I've had the privilege of actually trying that drink, and it's a remarkable introduction to shochu. Thank you very much. You see that. So, Jack, I know you got something pretty interesting there. Do you want to pull it out for us and we'll have a little taste? Sure. Uh, so, the spirit that I was working with uh, to come up with the cocktail was the uh, Ryukyu uh, Awamori, which was a unique challenge when coming up with a cocktail, uh, primarily because the ABV is only 24%. You know, most uh, spirits that bartenders are used to using as a, as a base spirit are 40% have that alcohol backbone to really stand up to a lot of old, other bold flavors. And if we're doing something low ABV, it's commonly with something aromatized like a vermouth or an Amaro, you know, something that brings its own bold punch of flavor because it doesn't have that alcohol backbone. So this Oamori has neither of those things. What it Can we does have a little have, taste of it? I yeah, know absolutely. It For sure. I would love to. So the nice thing about Oamoris is they're all long grain rice, all single fermentation, all black koji. Uh, the differentiation is essentially if it's atmospheric distillation or reduced pressure and the ABV and having one this low mm -hmm. mm, is actually unusual. They're usually much stronger. And this is what's called kusu awamori, which means at least 50% of the liquid has been aged for at least three years. So there's and, a whole lot going on here and it's, it's mm -hmm. delicious to try, but can you talk us through indeed how you get from that to something which will present in a cocktail, given that it is only 24% uh, ABV? Sure. And, and again, it's not necessarily the ABV that was a challenge, although, I, you know, I, I was sort of able to normalize that. Uh, you'll see how in a moment, but that incredible su subtlety, that purity of flavor. It's almost like taking a sip of distilled water that sort of melts into like those white flowers, pink flowers, that like underripe white peach note right on like across your tongue as you, you know, are savoring those first few sips. It's like pure water and then this like subtle like crescendo of flavor. So I didn't want to hide that in any way. So I thought about, you know, traditional serves like the sodawari and how I could sort of take a Western format of drinks and marry this, you know, incredibly subtle spirit with something familiar. And what I decided to do was uh, a relatively, you know, of course, I'm never going to do anything traditional. That's just not how I was taught. Uh, you know, I'm from the Dave Arnold School of Bartending where nothing is easy and you do 300% of the work for 110% of the results. So that's what I've done again today. Uh, and I came up with a drink I've just called the Awamori Highball, you know, looks deceptively simple and it can be, I'll talk about how to make it at home. But uh, the, the first thing that I wanted to do when creating this cocktail was normalize the ABV. You know, most, uh, cocktails that you of the, the highball style, you know, like a gin and tonic, if it's two ounces of 40 proof or sorry, 80 proof spirit and four and a half ounces of tonic or soda, what have you, you know, that's right around 12% alcohol. And I wanted to keep this final cocktail right in that range. So at 24%, I used three and a uh, three ounces of the Awamori. So cocktail is absolutely terrific 
for uh, depletions on a back bar. So it's three ounces of awamori and uh, three and a half ounces of modifier, which puts the finished drink right at like 11, 11 and change percent, which is right where you wanna be for this style of cocktail. So it's gonna drink like the drinks that you know and love, the GNTs, the whiskey sodas of the world. So that was the first step. And the second step was choosing ingredients that are not uh, gonna overpower the subtlety of the flavors. I wanted both uh, complementary flavors and supplementary flavors that were gonna bolster what's already there. So immediately I get that, that subtle white peach note was something that really jumped out to me. So I wanted to play with that primarily. And growing up as a kid, one of my all time favorite uh, beverages, you know, like go to this, go to the, you know, mini mart and grab something. It was always a peach snapple. So anytime I taste peach, I want to do peach and tea and bright acid together. Uh, so that's what I've done here. So my cocktail starts with uh, five drops of a saline solution. So it's just uh, 20 grams of salt and 80 grams of water. A little salt always just like adds that pop of flavor. It also helps the, the subtle umami back, backbone and the awamori uh, show itself a little better. So I've got five drops of saline solution and then a half ounce of a sudachi cordial that I've made. So I took sudachi juice, clarified it in a centrifuge, added equal parts by weight, sugar, uh, brought it up to a simmer with some lemon and lime peels, cut the heat, let that uh, you know come back to room temp, and then added 30 grams of citric acid per liter of product. If you don't wanna do that, I completely understand. Uh, you can just add a little bit of simple syrup and a little bit of sudachi juice if you've got it. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with sudachi, it's a hybrid of mandarin orange and uh, yuzu, which is absolutely lovely, floral, beautifully aromatic. It's my kind of secret favorite cocktail citrus. Unfortunately, it's very rare to find fresh in the States. So I did use a bottled product. You know, you can find these at a lot of uh, Asian markets, especially if you can find a Japanese market. Uh, so it's a pasteurized product, but I find that uh, because it's such a, you know, floral flavor dense uh, citrus juice that it's fine in these applications as a pasteurized product. So it's a half ounce of that Sudachi cordial that I made. And then uh, an ounce of water because of the next ingredient being a little bit bold, I wanted to just give it some pure water just as a, an additional lengthener. And then two ounces of, uh, of brewed tea. And the tea that I chose is a blended tea of hojicha, which is roasted stems of green tea and uh, roasted rice. So I'm going back to that, uh, that rice that's such a prominent flavor in the awamori, you know, I wanted to double up that, you know, roasty toasty rice note while adding that, you know, smoky complexity of the, the hojicha tea. So it's that supplementary and complementary flavors that ultimately create this, you know, not so snappily uh, modern take on a peach snapple. Now, as I do, I uh, combine all of those into a one liter soda bottle and I've got my uh, carbonation rig ready here. I've already got a batch of this cocktail that I've chilled down in the freezer. So it's almost frozen. Uh, and I've got my soda stream carbonation rig here. Show you how to carbonate this one final time. It's almost ready to go. So, don't try this at home, folks. And I also have a recipe that I've designed with the same flavors, uh, but just topping with club soda. The ratio is slightly different so that you maintain some of the bubbles. But if you've got a carbonation rig at home, I really recommend uh, carbonating all the ingredients whenever you can because. You know, when you're adding three ounces of a spirit to a cocktail, that's three ounces of liquid in the finished drink that won't have bubbles in it. So if you can add the bubbles to it, you know, why not? I think it's only going to add to the quality of the finished drink. So just right over some large cubes, I'm just giving that a moment for the bubbles to settle. I think that should be just fine. Awesome. 
crack that open so it doesn't foam too, too aggressively. And we'll just go ahead and pour that into a highball glass. So there's a lot of work on the front end. So if you were to serve this at a bar, there it would be a, a very quick serve during service because you just have to open the bottle and pour. It's a lot of, uh, of, of work behind the scenes to create a really delicious, really simple serve uh, for your friends and family or in a bar setting. So cheers. Cheers, Jack. That looks remarkable. I know I speak on behalf of almost everybody tuning in here when I say we'd all love to be tasting that along with you. But in the absence of that, uh, have a taste, everybody. If you have the JSS kit, if you don't have this, by the way, you can order it from liquorlab.com uh, because it does contain a tasting of the Ruku Ocho Awamori that Jack's just used to uh, mix his cocktail. So I think we've now reached that stage in the proceedings where we can start to look and see uh, are there any questions in the chat? I don't see anything at the moment, but that's okay. Because da, 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 da. I've got more than enough questions for all uh, our presenters here. So, Nicola, we've had a, the chance to try a few different shochus so far, right? And I know you've got a lot of unusual spirits at patent pending here in New York, and you've got a lot of unusual spirits and cocktails on the menu. How do you like to preserve the subtlety of flavor when you're making a cocktail? When you get something delicate, maybe it's a delicate flavor, a low ABV. Are there any techniques that you usually fall back on? No, you, you have to think through material. Uh, honestly, a uh, number of soldiers tried, especially a low ABV one, are triggering uh, amazing options for low, low ABV martinis. Um, amazing option uh, to go gentle. Uh, lately, I think everything is just kind of like punchy. It needs to be like sharp. It needs to be explosion of flavor. Soju is offering us a chance to have like rich, interesting, honest flavor that is highlighted with something that doesn't need to be aggressive. Exactly. So and marrying it to something familiar like you did at the Sour is probably a, a clever thing. So, Jack, let me ask you, shochu's not like anything most people have had, at least here in the West. What would be the way you'd introduce it to people at a bar? What kind of cocktails would you choose? Sure. So I think that in, in my experience, the best way to get someone who's sitting in front of you at a bar interested in a product is to be overwhelmingly excited about it. And then at that point, you can serve them anything in a glass. But if you say, I just tried this for the first time, I'm thrilled to be sharing it with you. It's insanely delicious. Try a little bit on its own and then I'm gonna make you something with it. And just that, those sentences, you have uh, created a drinker of whatever product you're gonna put in front of that person for life. So I would start with, I love this, here's, uh, you know, a half an ounce, just taste this in glass and then I'll come back, make you a drink and we'll talk about it. And then I think starting with something familiar like a sour, I think as long as you're using uh, a, a shochu or an awamori that's at like 40%, you know, a, a higher ABV example. And I think that for one of the lower ABV examples, I think something like uh, a highball or a serve just with warm water or, you know, in like a, a subtle flavor change. So you really allow them to experience the spirit for what it is rather than try and make, you know, fit this decidedly square peg into the round hole of, you know, most traditional Western style cocktails. I think that having something specifically designed around the spirit is gonna be the most successful for a lower ABV product. Yeah, and it almost answers the question we just got from one of our dear uh, viewers, Warren Johnson, which is, okay, what's another way to incorporate lower ABV shochu into a cocktail apart from adding an increased amount of it? Like my mind would go to, you know, really stripping it back and just having the shochu with maybe one or two ingredients, almost like martini style. 
What do you think, Nicola? Yeah, I mean, there are a few, few ways how you can uh, work. We showed you um, another way if you have something uh, over APV, like this uh, beautiful relento uh, brown sugar, showed you. Even a bar spoon of a uh, quarter of an ounce of uh, really nice uh, overproof rum can work with this soju, so it doesn't need to be always the main star. It can be also a great companion in a cocktail. That's also another way how we can use it. But I think approach needs to be uh, uh, unique for most of the sojus because pretty much every uh, distiller is having unique approach and unique flavor. Uh, just the variety of ingredients that we can use, uh, we showed you, is tremendous. It's kind of like the only spirit uh, pretty much that reflects all those ingredients in a bottle. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do a lot of uh, tasting to educate people because when you know the wide range of flavors that shochu can have, the uh, differences in strengths, the regional differences, it's the start at least it was for me, of a real love affair with Chochu. Whoops, another question. So, Jack or Nicola, what would you make with the bigger, spicier uh, products like Satsuma Genshu, which is unfiltered uh, Honkaku Shochu? Let's see. I've got the Satsuma Genshu right here, and I have a clean glass. So, I'm going to This is going to work out. Yeah. I always make sure to, to come to these events with plenty of clean glassware so I don't have to walk away. I can always be ready to taste. Don't think we haven't noticed that bottle of Malibu on your back bar, Jack. <laughs> I'm a company man, Philip. I've done plenty of work for Pernod Ricard. <laughs> it, it's astonishing bar, man. Looks amazing. It's, uh, it's, it's shared with another wonderful bartender named Joey Smith. So we, we've cultivated uh, quite, a, quite a back bar here. All right. So big, powerful nose here. Mm -hmm. We're up in the ABVs. We're at 37% for anyone who doesn't know about Satsuma Genshu. It's sweet potato, regular pressure distillation. I've had the pleasure of going to this distillery in Kagoshima. And it is really uh, powerful and punchy and spicy. Thoughts, yeah, gentlemen? I'm I'm getting a ton of green chili immediately. Uh, and it, it immediately, my first reaction was to, I would wanna mix this with probably like a Highland tequila, like something that's a little bit more mineral driven, more aromatic, but has that agave backbone. Uh, because I think this sort of chili spiciness would pair really beautifully with that, like create this full round flavor profile uh, maybe not necessarily like directly into a margarita, but I think some citrus, maybe a mixed citrus, uh, cocktail with, with those two spirits. In fact, I think I've got, yeah, here we go. I've got some Highland tequila right here. I'm just going to pour it right in the glass and see how those two, uh, marry with each other. Well, while you're sampling that, Nicola, what do you think? A full strength so, uh, shochu? Actually... Yeah, I have an interesting idea. I think that like nice and uh, creamy orange can uh, work really nice uh, um, with some bitters. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that's how I will show you. Uh, just because if you if you recall that uh, old classic Japanese uh, cocktail, it would be fun to put Japanese product in Japanese cocktail. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So how's that tasting over there, Jack? It's uh, absolutely delicious. I'm, I'm pleased when my instincts work, work, work the way that I believe they're going to. You know, I don't, I don't get to make cocktails as often as I used to, not having a, a bar to work at, but I'm just going to add a touch of Sudachi cordial to that combination and see if my, my instinct of citrus, tequila, and the Satsuma Genshu is, is on point. Do you think you're moving towards some kind of an old-fashioned or more towards a gimlet? You know, I think this could work in, in either either of those realms, like a, a bright citrus cordial in a very small quantity as sort of a, a variation on something like a Oaxacan old fashioned. This could even take a bar spoon of mezcal. These flavors are so bold. Um, mm. And it would also work as a brighter shaken drink with, with uh, you know, something like a gim gimlet or 
even with, with lemon and a few drops of, of yuzu, because it can be cost prohibitive, no one's using, you know, three quarters of an ounce of yuzu in a cocktail, but a split lemon and yuzu with tequila and the setsuma genshu, I think would be absolutely delicious. And in fact, that would be, that would be my final recommendation for using this specific product would be well, a sour, just no egg white, lemon, uh, like a few dashes of yuzu juice. If pasteurized is all you can get, that's perfectly fine. Uh, simple syrup, some saline solution, and then one, one, uh, a nice Highland tequila, like Siete Leguas, and one ounce of the Setsuma Genshu. Yeah, I think that's really valid. And I also like Nicola's idea, whenever you get something big and muscular and powerful, putting it into a uh, more textured, even viscous mixes with things like Orgeat, even into tropical drinks, makes a hell of a lot of sense. Absolutely. Actually, what you just said, like four cutter was second thing uh, crossed my mind. Oh. Four, yeah, four cutter also with Orgeat, but uh, some versions use Pisco, and I think that like putting uh, such style of shoju as dominant can definitely work with some citrus and Orgeat. Oh, well, really, so much of the shochu is made around places where sugarcane grows. There's nothing like flying into Okinawa and seeing the fields of uh, sugarcane. Yeah, I'm so, sure this would be delicious with the, the core core Okinawan rum. I think that would be a spect spectacular pairing, the Satsuma Genshu and a, a bold sort of agricole style rum like that. Yeah, there's quite a few shochu distilleries around Naha in uh, Okinawa that are making uh, Japanese rum as well. There's a new one from Mizuho Shuzo called uh, One Rum uh, Yonaguni Island, which is made by a distiller that I know, Akira Nakazuto, that I'm really dying to try because it looks excellent. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'll, you book the flights and I'm there. Excellent. Which reminds me, by the way, everybody, put in your questions. Uh, we're moving towards wrapping this up. So do put your questions in the chat if you have them. But talking about trips to Japan, Jack, Nicola, and everybody, I'm going to come straight with you. Entering the Shochu Cocktail Contest, which you can do on shochu.guide before 31 January, is probably the best chance you have of getting a trip to Japan, apart from buying a ticket yourself. Hopefully, it'll be able to happen this year if you win, but we will go to Japan for a week. And there's also going to be tons of distillery visits and bar visits and all that kind of thing in there. The requirements are relatively modest, so hit up Shochu.guide for all the details of the Shochu Cocktail Contest. And it kind of, you know, barrels into... Shochu Cocktail Week, which is going to be happening from 1 to 14 March in places like uh, Bar Kumiko in Chicago, Bar Goto here in New York, Half Step in Austin in Texas, and a ton of places in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And if you want to study up for the cocktail competition, stay connected with JSS underscore Shochu. That's JSS underscore Shochu on Instagram, where they'll post edited versions of these webinars. They'll post details of the competitions, reminders of what's going on, and other kind of educational resources. So has anybody, and this includes you and uh, Nicola, Jack, got any questions before we wrap this all up and head off for uh, early afternoon shochu cocktails. No, I'm not seeing it. So it only falls to me to say on behalf of the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association, thank you to everyone who has tuned in today, also to the other seminars, featuring superstars like Ryan Chetty Wardana, Ariel Johnson, Aidan Bowie, Julia Mimose, Brian Evans, Takuma Watanabe. Uh, thank you to uh, Nicola Nicolatic of Patent Pending in New York. You should all go and visit Nicola as soon as you can. The bar is rocking every night. And Jack Schramm, who can be found on Solid Wiggle for a fantastic alcoholic jelly, and also very often on Gush NYC, demonstrating things with his envy inducing back bar so please tune in the next time we do this stay connected and i really hope that i'll be able to have a drink with all of you all of you not just in new york 
but in Japan one of these days. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Cheers, guys. Cheers.